So Global Footprint Network has a vision of a world where we all thrive within the means of our planet. And really part and parcel to that is the idea that all thrive. For me, sustainability at its core is a social justice issue. Because if there is not enough, there is not enough to go around, then the inequity that exists in the world only gets more and more exacerbated. So I do what I do because I love data, and I love the people who live on this planet, and I love the beautiful planet that we are on. Our mission is to provide tools and analysis that help people make better decisions and help us move out of ecological overshoot. Who knows what ecological overshoot is? Anybody? All right. <laughs> so ecological overshoot is when we, as humanity, are using more than what the planet can regenerate. Um, and one of the things that we calculate using the ecological footprint and biocapacity or biological capacity is Earth Overshoot Day. And Earth Overshoot Day is the day of the year when we have used all of the resources that the planet will regenerate for the entire year. And this year, it fell on July 29th. So, starting July 30th, we, humanity, have been digging down into our savings, or we're working on credit. And by definition, that's not sustainable. We can't keep doing that indefinitely. And there's always, someone always asks me, well, how long can we be in overshoot? And my response is, well, how, how good of lives do you want people to have? Because we will continue as a species for a long time in overshoot, but the quality of life for people and the just, beautiful, um, and equitable world that we want to build it becomes further and further from reality. So, through our calculations, we know that uh, we're using roughly the equivalent of 1.7 Earths. And for those of us who live in the United States, uh, on average, we're using the equivalent of five Earths in, order, in, in the sense that if everyone lived like the average person in the United States, we would need five planets to support all of our consumption. Which brings me to why it is so important to have a, a, you know, a population that understands those limits not just because uh, it's important, but also because, or important in terms of being able to make good decisions, but it helps us understand where we need to put our effort. And so a lot of the data that we produce is intended to, to help support those efforts. Um, and one thing that's slightly different about the ecological footprint and the carbon footprint, which is what everybody talks about, is the ecological footprint thinks about all of the things that we need to, to run our world, right? It's not just climate change that is important. It's all of the, the natural resources that we need to take care of ourselves, to feed ourselves, to put clothes on our back, you know, to have these beautiful opportunities to sit in these lovely buildings and across each other from, <laughs> across tables from each other. Um, and so in some sense, Climate change is a symptom of overshoot, as is biodiversity loss, as is exploitation, oh, and, and the root of all that is the exploitation of people and land. And so really what we're doing as an organization is trying to translate these things, this data that shows all this information, into terms and um, language that we can share across the whole population not just for people who are, understand what a ton of carbon looks like or what two degrees Celsius means. Um, those are things that those of us who are in this space kind of can hold on to, but for everybody else, it's much easier to think about this in terms, uh, in, in slightly different terms. So um, with that, um, I have a lot more to say, but uh, I do recognize that there is a, a very, um, ah, there you are. Hi, Stephen. <laughs> um, because of the work that we do is so based in uh, data and metrics, when I got to meet Stephen and talk to him about his CAP project, I got really excited. And you are going to see why in just a moment. Um, but uh, 
just to wrap up, I'm really excited to be here. We've got a really cool couple of conversations to have. And please write down your questions, because it's going to be, I think there'll be some, some great things for you to dig into. Uh, and with that, Stephen, would you be willing to tell us a little bit more about, or I guess not a little bit more, all about <laughs> your CAP project um, and what you've, what you've come up with? What do you want to achieve? Hello, everyone. Um, lovely to meet you all. Uh, my name is Stephen, and thank you, Lauren uh, Laurel, for the introduction. Um, so my Climate Action Project primarily focuses on turning student anxiety into forms of action, um, and action not just in the form of protests, but into the form of emotional c capability and being able to manage your emotions around climate change. Um, so the the key there's two key areas to it we've got the research section and the action section so the research is primarily focused on trying to figure out who we need to target and and which areas of students within universities within schools um are, are lacking in the the knowledge around climate change but also lacking in in being able to manage their um, emotions around climate change so that that's the the two main sections within the research um, and then we've got the action section which is how do we manage um, students who are lacking in climate change um, education and how do we manage students who are really anxious or a mixture of the two um, so that's the the key premise of um, the, the research and the action um, but how are we going to do it so um, we do the research find out which individuals we need to target. So in, in for my case at university, I have students which are in uh, doing history, students which are doing environmental science. Um, those doing history might not have much education around climate change. So therefore they need that education. Those doing environmental science, they're, they're, they're the know-it-all, they know everything. <laughs> um, so their actual ability to cope with the, the anxiety that comes alongside it is, interesting but worrying as well um we, we haven't been taught how to cope with that so uh, when it comes to the process we've got stage three which is design and prototyping so we design this workshop and the workshops are primarily aimed at um these two things so we've got the the education and the action um and it doesn't just help with students but it also helps with staff and we must acknowledge that it's a universal issue especially anxiety and education um, but students are a catalyst for this um, my initial aims for this whole project re revolve around a an accessible interactive and exciting set of climate tools for every student's journey within university within schools um, we want to allow students to be able to feel safe in a space for them to express their emotions around climate and that anxiety, not just to, to go for a protest, because protests are very powerful. But if you go to a protest, yes, you, you don't feel alone, but actually when you're on your own, you do sometimes, I've always had that time to myself where I've been, I, I've been thinking about climate change and I feel sad. And that, that, that what kind of inspired me to do this. Um, and then we've got other sections of aims where I want to be able to make a final project and, and templates to be able to share with different schools and universities, along with research, um, so that these schools and universities can conduct their own or be a part of a big, big project, which I'll get to later. And then also alongside this, it will come with templates for lectures and workshops. Um, I'm thrilled about this project for a number of reasons. I think it is super exciting to uh, it's super exciting to think about um, getting more information about different uh, the different parts of the university because we know that people are reacting in different ways and experiencing climate anxiety in different ways. Um, and I think when we spoke earlier this week, I got really excited because I can see how powerful it would be to collect this data um, and to, to not maybe not just in, in, in your university, but all around the world, because I think it's so important for us to understand how to meet people where they are. Um, so I, I got really, really excited about the conversation and I started like throwing tons and tons of ideas at Stephen so that <laughs> maybe we could turn this into like a whole dissertation potentially, but, or maybe just a big project. But uh, I think it's just, I think it's wonderful what you're doing and I'm really excited to see what happens next.
Thank you. I'm, I'm really hopeful that this um, like earth shots uh, to be able to conduct this research around the world will provide agency for, for students and ability to um, create mass change just through through numbers. Um, so I, I've got a, a question for you, Laurel. Um, with your work at the Global Footprint Network, what are you hoping to address um, climate anxiety? How are you hoping to do that? What processes and such? Yeah, so, you know, we have been working in climate communication for a long time. Um, Global Footprint Network started in 2003, and initially the organization thought, okay, we're going to put this data out there, put it in front of governments, and they're going to see it, and they're going to change everything because they're going to realize how awful it is and how dire the situation is. And, spoiler alert, <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> um, what we've learned over all the years is how important it is uh, that the communication around climate is emotionally resonant, that people understand it, not because they're looking at a graph, but because they understand how it affects them um, and how it affects their communities and constituents. And so um, one of the important things that we've tried to really incorporate as an organization is establishing that emotional resonance and how we talk about uh, climate change and ecological overshoot and ecological footprint with other people. Um, we don't want to say reduce your footprint because that feels contracting, feels hard and yucky, um, or just like a chore. But we know that there are so many things that we can do, so many solutions that are out there that are amazing, um, that are actually going to make our lives better. So it's not about lowering the footprint, per se. It's about finding a different path that ev makes everyone's lives better. Um, and so in talking about these very data-heavy ideas, we always try to find a way to, to frame that um, in, in a sense that, you know, that, that it's going to meet people, like I said, where they are. And I think you know, one of the examples of that is you all took the calculator. Um, if you got to the end, after you got your results, there's an opportunity, to, you got asked a question. You said, how did this, you know, how did your results make you feel? Um, and I think, and then you can say worried, shocked, inspired, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and what we found is that, actually, anecdote. When I, a few years ago, uh, I was on the Conscious College tour with Turning Green, and I was at all these colleges, and we would give people an iPad with the calculator, and I got to sit next to them as they finished. And then what I saw was them being shocked and <laughs> worried and surprised. Um, and I was able to talk to people about that experience um, because I'm standing right next to them, explain what it means, explain how it compares to other people in their country. Um, but I realized that didn't, that wasn't happening for the you know millions of people who are taking this calculator every year. Um, so we were trying to think of how do we create that space to reflect on the way that we feel about it um, at scale, like through the calculator, rather than expecting that there's gonna, always going to be someone sit, sitting beside you able to walk you through it. Um, so we're working on that, but I think that there's some really exciting potential for learning more about different um, groups of students based on their major or the college that they're in. And so there's this amazing idea that we can, you know, kind of further that um, concept by tailoring messages in a way that helps, helps really reach them and create emotional resonance in a more a ta tailored way. Um, and I know that, uh, you know, so part of that is, is about emotional resonance. Um, in terms of communication, but in terms of climate anxiety, you know, this is in the same vein, right? We're, we're still talking about people's emotions. Um, and something that we see in, in climate communication is that you either get the doom and gloom, and it's terrifying and awful and imminent, or you get these techno solutions, uh, everything's gonna be fine, we're gonna fix it all, it's gonna be great. And the truth is much more in between. So trying to find that balance between being honest and looking at the data in a real unshaked, unshaken, shaken, unshaken way, that's not a word, <laughs> but you know what I meant, 
um, while still acknowledging that there's something very scary and tangible and real about that. Um, and I think that, that is, that's such an important piece of how we need to think about this. And you, as leaders, have the ability to take those things for yourself and use that idea in your respective spheres of influence. You each have these communities that you are operating in um, and, and doing your work in, and you're, you're, you have the ability to, to take these lessons yourselves. And, and reach your, you know, your fellow students, your administrations, your um, local governments, whatever it is, and, and really, um, yeah, and, and, and find that way to, to meet people where they are. I agree. I, I, yeah, I really like that um, form of framing and agency and being able to, um, yeah, the action is within us all and um, it just has to be released in, in forms of shifting that form of uh, <laughs> anxiety into, into powerful action for everyone um, and, and being able to connect with your, your inner emotions and not just hiding them. Um, that's really powerful. So we kind of touched on this quite a bit about how important uh, communication and knowing your audience is. Um, and obviously that's one of the big reasons that I'm really excited about the students' project. Um, but I was wondering, maybe, Stephen, can you tell us more about uh, your thoughts around going beyond just your university? Um, and can, is it possible for other people to get involved in those efforts? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I mean, yes is the, the very basic, straight, straightforward answer. Um, but with regards to the how and, and why, it why is, like, this data is... Um, people think as numbers is, is um, sometimes being scary because we're, we're like looking at students and just putting numbers on them. But in reality, it's it's gauging an understanding of how well they they understand the crisis and how well different students, different ages, um, different uh, across different regions, different countries, even within countries, you've got different cities and towns. Um, and you, you'll be able to gauge an understanding of what education systems really work for students as well um, and and why what we can learn from other systems and maybe implement into other ones um, not just in forms of climate education but in forms of how students can manage their emotions because in school myself I wasn't taught how to really manage my emotions <laughs> you know it's not something that most people are taught I, I that I know anyway um, and I think that that's silly because it like most of us on average in our life will experience some form of mental health issue and we might not even realize it at the time because we're not taught what the signs are or how to cope with it so that this data will be able to, to will be able to use and speak to education secretaries we can we can bring data and numbers to governments and say hey these are the this is the percentage of students at at all your schools around the country or on average around the, your country that are anxious around climate change and you look at how what anxiety has done to people in the past with protests and people with shifting votes um the thing is the youth we are the future you know with the, the future voters we're the future of the population and governments are going to want to know what their their future population look for in a government you know, if that's a whole system change, that that's that's what it is. You know, if it means that shifting to renewable energy much faster, that's governments are going to be much more likely to do that if they realise that the future of their population, who are going to teach their children, I'm going to teach my children to be as green as possible. You know, I'm pretty sure everybody here will, and that will progress to to different a whole system change as as we develop. But what we need is now. Um, and this data is what it provides now um, and will hopefully shift education systems around the world. It will push for governments and not just governments, but institutions to be able to take, take action to even educate their staff. It doesn't have to target primarily students, but it would mean that older, young, young adults in work are able to learn about climate change and how to manage that, that anxiety. Um, and these are life skills that, that people should really be taught. Um, that like the World Health Organization has said that 
it's a key part to human health. We we mental health. We we needs to be looked after. Um, but yes, this uh, data is is incredible. It provides <laughs> lots of opportunity to be able to work out which areas need more education, which areas need more focus on mental health, um, and which areas might be completely lacking in both. Um, or some areas might provide teachers lessons on how we can do that as well. I would like to say, <laughs> there's so one more thing in there. Um, you, you all, many of you flew here, right? At the beginning of the flight, they always say, put your own mask on first before helping the kid, or the, if there's a child next to you. And when it comes to mental health, you're not, even if you are the most passionate person in the world, if you're not taking care of yourself, you're not giving all of yourself to this, to this movement. And so it's not selfish to want to take care of yourself and to get the mental health support that you need. So never think of that as a weakness. That is allowing you to be the strongest you can be. Absolutely. I couldn't have said it best myself. But um, being able to take control of, of your emotions is, and, and, and realize them and work with them to make yourself a better person and provide more energy into the areas which matter to you.